Hello, everybody. I'm just waiting on Miss Lauren Rosen. We are going to be t uh, talking about acceptance part two today. Um, t just picking up where we left off from two weeks ago. <laughs> so um, if everyone could just tell us where they're calling in from or streaming in from, I should say. And did everyone watch the football games this weekend? There she comes. Dude. Dude. The football games were intense this weekend. Whoa. That was no freaking joke. No joke. Did, and did you watch them? I, I did. Them. Yeah. Is your sound or my sound staticky? I don't know. It is a little staticky, but is it? I'm at, at least not. I'm like I'm coming through the mic, right? Because that didn't happen a couple weeks ago. Sorry, guys, for the technical talk. No, you're good. You're good, and the static went away. It was yes. more like a connection-y sound. Okay. Welcome. So, Welcome, everybody, to Purely OCD. Welcome to Purely OCD, folks. So we're talking about, like you were saying, acceptance and OCD again. And I actually, I brought notes because we had kind of talked about at the end of last time what we wanted to cover today because we didn't get to it last time. So... Um, yeah. Do you mind if I, if I share what we had talked about? Let's do it. Let's do it. I was actually going to pull up. I took screenshots of the questions we didn't um, get to go through as well. So you take, take the lead. Brilliant. Okay. So um, next time, uh, and, the, and this is next time, by the way, uh, we, decided, <laughs> <laughs> we decided we would discuss accepting uncertainty accepting the diagnosis of OCD, uh, mindfulness meditation and how it can support acceptance and maybe even do an expansion exercise. That's oh dear. I know. So we may not get to, maybe we need to do a part three. I mean, this is a big topic. Yeah. We, well, we could break it up and well, we could break it up into more like acceptance and expansion, expansion exercises or. I like it. Yeah. So, I mean, do we want to talk about accepting uncertainty or what do we think as a starting point, accepting the diagnosis? Uh, either one is good. <clears throat> accepting Sorry, brain stride. No, that's all good. I'm going to go ahead and say, I think accepting the diagnosis is a little bit more in keeping with what we've already been talking about and maybe a good transition point. Um, because, you know, if anyone wasn't here last time or didn't get a chance to check out the, the first, we were talking about accepting thoughts and feelings and, and why acceptance is what makes sense. And we talked about acceptance and commitment therapy. Kelly did an awesome exercise with all of us. Um, so, you know, we were talking really about making space for these experiences, these, as they say, enact private experiences. Um, oh, man, and I love that. Of private experiences. I have so many private experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like all private experiences. Um, but yeah, I think I, uh, so making space for stuff is really where we were at. And one of the things that does often come up in treatment is this like, I don't want to have OCD. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I, I ditto. wanted it. <laughs> ditto. Ditto. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, right. Ditto too. So how do we navigate that? Through acceptance <clears throat> is the short answer. But how do we get to a place of acceptance? <sighs> yeah. it's, it's not a simple answer. I think that I think grieving, this is where like the grieving aspect is like we can leave space for grieving of what um, you hoped things would be like without OCD or right, what OCD has maybe taken from you. Mm -hmm. But that said, 
is saying, okay, now at some point we have to move away from grief and go more into committed action of now that this is on board, how am I going to choose to live my life based out of values and proceed knowing that I'm somebody who lives with intrusive thoughts? Because honestly, that, that piece that Lauren's talking about where people are stuck in the why do I have to have OCD? Why me? Why is this happening? Their trajectory of recovery is a lot longer. And yeah, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Marina. No, I just was going to agree. It's, it's, a, it's such an important piece because it just keeps you stuck because then you're so focused on, I don't want to have this, that you're not actually finding all of the experiences that you can cultivate that are different, right? That it's funny. So, um, because Kelly and I are mindfulness nerds, uh, we, we were talking about the loss of Thich Nhat Hanh last, Mm -hmm. last week, who is this, I know, incredible. (laughs) I know. I don't like that. This is stupid. Yeah. He was 95 years old. We needed at least a hundred years, if not more. But he's this incredible Buddhist monk and, and we talk a lot about mindfulness and, you know, the reality is that that's really secular, a lot of it like overlap with secular Buddhism, like so non-religious, but uh, he has this book called No Mud, No Lotus that actually Kelly Mm -hmm. introduced me to. And in it, he talks about the fact that sometimes people try to eradicate unpleasant experiences and that this is, he says it, this is not correct, which I this is, not, <laughs> this is not correct. Don't do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, 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 like I'm remembering the, the words that he, he uses, uh, happiness is possible right here today, but happiness cannot be without sadness. And I'd say the same for anxiety. Happiness cannot be without anxiety. And yeah. so, if we're so focused on, I don't want to have this experience, I don't like this, then we don't get to look toward the joy and to find the joy. Um, it muddies the water. Well, but, at, and what, what we're working on is make allowing, it's funny. It's like, we want the, the, the water to be muddy. We want to allow the water to be muddy because the reality is we're never going to have the experience of just, Right. Pure, well, we're rarely going to have the experience of pure happiness. Can we live a life that is contaminated by the fact that we have OCD? If that makes sense. Totally makes sense. It sure does. And to your point, there is room for grief. And, mm-hmm. and how much more time do we want to spend focusing on and uh, yeah, giving our time away to OCD. Like th- there's already been all of this time that has been sacrificed to OCD through compulsions of all sorts. And that's, that's kind of where I go is like, yes, you, you, there's grief and, and open to the grief, the feeling. And do we want to like churn about it and think about what could have been or what might've been different, you know? Right. And I, I can't help but think about Grayson when he talks about Dr. Jonathan Grayson, when he talks about the wishing compulsion. Yeah. He's like wishing I didn't have these thoughts. And the reality is, is like an act would say is you're rejecting reality, right? It's like the reality is you do have them. Yep. So getting upset about them is only causing more mental distress. So- right the only way through this is acceptance. That's it. Or doing it that way, in which case you will continue to perpetuate this feeling. Yep. Because, and that's like where the difference between pain and suffering comes into play. Mm -hmm. Right. The pain is, is there. You, Mm -hmm. if you had the choice, you wouldn't give yourself OCD. And yet suffering is when we resist what is. And so that, which is why it only, uh, the only thing that makes sense is to accept pain and to accept challenging experiences because 
the, the option, the other option is to make them worse, especially when they're like, we can't change them. You know, we can't change the fact that we have brains that work in a certain way. Right. And brains are problem solving machines. So they're trying to say, okay, how do I fix this? Because I don't like this feeling. But the reality is, is that, you know, the crux of everything we do is saying we must accept those feelings if you do want to have relief on the other side. And by relief, I'm not guaranteeing that there's no anxiety on the other side. Right. But no additional, you're not, you're not building compound anxiety. Yeah, there's exactly. no compound interest. Don't compound your interest here, people. <laughs> I've got to be honest. I did that for a long time. It doesn't yeah. Work. Student and loans I've, doesn't go well. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So, yeah, I was going to say something else about accepting the diagnosis. I love that you brought up Grayson's article, and I'm, I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, maybe that was it. the wishing ritual and comparison and all of that. It's like, do you want to live in that? Or do you want to live in, okay, this is what is, how can I optimize my life right. knowing that this is, this is how my brain works. Yes. I choose that one. Yes. Don't turn your back on reality. Mm -mm. Somebody was saying, how can we ignore unwanted thoughts that cause so much anxiety? And I think uh, just, uh, we can't always catch the, the comments that go by, but just generally speaking, this is, we're not talking about ignoring. We're just talking about accepting without them being sort of the, the central focus of life. We don't need to ignore anything. We just have to allow lots and lots of different experiences. The ones we like, the ones we don't like, et cetera. Yep. Thoughts, feelings, diagnoses, and what have you. Mm -hmm. Very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so not to try to sideline us here or sideline sidebar, us, sidebar us, whatever. I'm ready. I'm ready for a good sidebar. Is that um, IGTV no longer allows you to post anything over <clears throat> an hour. So oh. last week, um, we went over an hour with the comfort zone with Emma and Lisa. Aha. Uh -huh. So you can only find it on Lauren's page. I just took one, a one minute clip and put it there. So we will try to, you know, keep these things relatively shorter so we can upload things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah certainly under the hour mark. And I know we've got a limit time today. What's, um, what, when do we need to, I'll let you take the lead on that. Yeah, probably like, you know, one ten. Okay. Perfect. Cool. So what about uncertainty? What about it? <laughs> uh, accepting <laughs> it. I'm thinking, <laughs> You're like, really? I'm th that guy. Yeah, but um, I guess be more specific in what we want to talk about with it. Well, I think I imagine that people would want to have more information about how to accept uncertainty. So we had, we had talked about this uh, acceptance part one two weeks ago, just a reminder. Um, mm -hmm. And under the context of different subtypes, right? Right. We had talked about like sexual orientation, OCD uh, in particular, I think. But you're saying in general, like AKA remove compulsions and sit with the feeling. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, just the, because I think we were talking about thoughts and accepting thoughts. And I think there's a, right, obviously a difference between accepting thoughts, the presence of the thought and accepting the uncertainty about what the thought brought to our minds, right? Like all of a sudden it's like this thought pops in and, it, and you are now aware of uncertainty that you weren't thinking of before potentially. Mm. And so... Yeah what happens with OCD is that then we try to annihilate uncertainty 
naturally. How do we fix it? How do we figure it out? So that's the problem though, as we talk about all the time. And so it's down to accepting that this uncertainty is there. And we don't have to talk about it a whole lot because I think we talk about it all the time. But while we're on this topic of acceptance, accepting uncertainty is obviously pretty critical in this process. Um, and, it, and they're all into, interrelated, right? Accepting thoughts, accepting feelings, accepting uncertainty. But I just thought I'd do a nod to it and any thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's anything different than what we've talked about, right? Is when a new thought comes in is treating thoughts as all equal and without judgment and not saying this one's more important than the other. And this one, I do have the right to um, get certainty on. Because I do feel like there's something about like the right, like there's this, uh, mm. not privilege, but like entitled, this, entitled, entitled, entitled to, uns- uh, to entitled. certainty. It's there's, Oh, there's a little bit of arrogance involved in it. And I'm not talking about just like people with OC. I'm talking about myself as well. It's like, mm-hmm. ah, this one's super important though. And what- right. And sometimes people will say comments like, well, what about like, I'm sure that my family loves me. Right. Or I'm sure like, and it's like, well, no, we're not sure of anything, actually, which is weird. Yeah, we're not. Right. Sorry. I, I could I really go. No. I could really go down an existential conversation around this, too. But, yeah, I mean, there is no certainty around that. Is that you have a pretty strong idea Yeah, that that's the case, but we don't know with a hundred percent certainty. We just, we know enough to feel good enough to yeah. say they likely really like me and love me. Or we don't feel good about it, <laughs> but we just. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I'm saying, yeah, if we're yeah. going off of that fear. Like rash- and rational- uh, rationally you go, okay, well the facts point to this. So I guess I have to act as though this is the case unless I'm presented with other information, right? Like you- Kelly could not like me. I was thinking the same thing <laughs> about you not liking me or me not liking you, you not like me. <laughs> and I was also going to say, if any of my family's watching, can you just give me reassurance that you do? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't. <laughs> I don't think anyone's watching, but, um, but legitimate, legitimately in moments in our friendship, because we're anxious and I almost mm-hmm. can guarantee that Kelly has had the same anxiety. I'm almost positive that it's like, Oh my gosh. But what, what if, what if she changed her mind? What if she no mm-hmm. longer likes me? Like I, no, she, she figured me out. She, she figured me out. It happened on to me. Finally. Like I have to accept that uncertainty, even though of course that's totally abhorrent to me. Like Kelly's my dearest people on the planet. So it was like, ah, she might not like me, but, um, but accepting that that's a possibility is imperative. Otherwise I'm going to be stuck all day trying to figure out whether or not you like me. People pleasing and asking Mm -hmm. for reassurance and, or even just churning about it. Like, oh my gosh, well, I said this and should I text her now? I mean, this happens all the time in dating too, right? Like this whole, well, what are they thinking and how, and not that that's necessarily OCD, but I think we do see it play out more in people with OCD. Yeah. And it's not a particularly helpful behavior, whether or not you have the diagnosis. Yeah. It's certainly not getting them to like you more. No. <laughs> yeah. So all of that to say that, uh, that accepting that kernel of it's a possibility is, is what's required for us to move on with our lives. So when we talk about accepting uncertainty, a lot of people, and I know we talked about this last time that like the resignation piece, um, but it's not saying like, okay, we're accepting this thing is going to happen. We're saying we have to accept that it could happen. Otherwise it's going to run the show. Yep. Radical acceptance, just all the way. We got to go all the way in. 
That's right. And that's what my favorite book on this subject is by the beautiful Pema Chodron, mm-hmm. who is my favorite. And it's great. It's called Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change. I'm not telling Kelly because she also knows this because I give this book to, uh, well, I tell everyone in my life that they have to read that. Did I give you that book? Or you did. Not? I did. See, I just, yeah. I, I hand it out. I'm like, <laughs> read, I've read it twice. <laughs> My copy, like it's sitting next to other books. I can see it right now. It's so dirty, like, cause it's been carried around and leaked yeah. through so many times. But anyway, uh, the long of the short is that, that she talks about the fact that uncertainty, cause this book is not for people with OCD. It's for everyone. It's called living beautifully with uncertainty and change by Pema Chodron, P E M A C H O with the double dots, dots, dot D. D R O with the double dots. And that's, that's the name. And essentially it's not even for people with OCD. It's for just general people. And she talks about the fact that uncertainty is our birthright. It's the only thing that we have. And so if we're fighting that, if we're trying to get certainty, we get very rigid. Life becomes very unpleasant and the work is really to just lean in and say like, all right, here we go. And we're on this ride and that makes my stomach drop, but that's it. Yep. That is it. Groundlessness. That's what she talks oh, about. Oh, joy. <laughs> <laughs> ah. uh, the ground is constantly moving. But, and as much as you're right, like, and so often it's like, ah this is happening at the same token. It's total freedom. Yeah. And you can move in and out of that feeling too. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I move in and out of it all the time. I, I've already done it 10 times since we've been talking. So <laughs> I mean, um, given the time we have yes. a lot of questions. Should I? Yeah. Let's, let's answer some okay. questions. Yep. Okay, so we can do a um, whole one on mindfulness meditation and how it can support OCD. And- absolutely, I think that's good. It deserves its own. I agree. Um, so, uh, a few people asked about body sensations. <clears throat> Another person asked about health anxiety. So I'm. It's kind of the same for you know yes and no, but I'm going to pull one of them. Sounds good. Um. And I just lost it. Great. Well, we can um, talk generally about accepting full sensation. Oh, go. So a viewer asked, can you share more about acceptance of body sensations as response prevention? So I know we've talked a lot about intrusive thoughts and feelings, but let's also uh, give some attention to some of that bodily sensation experience. Yeah. So typically, and I can't speak for this person, but typically when someone's talking about body sensations, right, they're talking about either the benign obsessions, which is like automatic bodily experiences, private bodily experiences, <laughs> 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 like uh, blinking or swallowing or anyways, the breathing. heart breathing. Yeah. Or it could be like groinal response, right? Like, oh, I'm having a reaction in my groin area because I looked at somebody who was, or I saw a little kid and does that mean I'm attracted to them? Mm-hmm. It could also be health anxiety or illness anxiety related, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Where, oh my gosh, my leg hurts. Does that mean I'm having um, a heart attack or my arm hurts? Yep. So. And then there's just the, the physical sensations that come with anxiety and the, the whole, I don't want to feel this part, which I think is different, right? One is, one is the, I, I need to fix this experience. Like I want to I want to um, figure out whether or not this sensation means something, right? which is where accepting its presence without trying to figure out what it means is the response prevention. And then there's just the, 
I don't want to feel this. Right? Like not because I'm giving it meaning, but because I just don't like it. Right? So both of those. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so how do we accept it? Well, <laughs> it's not fun, but mm -hmm. like we said, there's freedom on the other side. Um, is the same way we would do it with anything with intrusive thoughts or feelings saying here it is noticing it coming back to the present moment there's yeah go ahead oh and i was gonna say and, and adding in there i don't know what this means right especially with things like the, the groinal response which we see in all sorts of iterations of ocd but let's take sexual orientation ocd right like having some sort of a groinal response to someone who you believe is not in line with what, what you're identified as, a, as being attracted to, um, that going, I don't know, maybe that does mean that I'm attracted to this individual, right? This, t uh, this gender of individual, et cetera. Yep. And, you know, we can even add exposures in there as well. These are always a, a fun exposure, right? is like exposure work actually does get us closer to accepting uncertainty because we're sort of doing an overcorrection and proving that this theory is likely untrue, or if it is true, you're welcome for that trigger, that you are likely to be able to handle a catastrophic event. And it's not as catastrophic as you thought it would, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that answers the question. I think so too. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, and um, I, as you're looking for another one, I just wanted to say too, um, the, the piece about what you said about exposure is an overcorrection uh, and, and it's, it like gets acceptance in action, right? It's saying I am, I'm accepting this uncertainty so much that I'm just going to do this thing. Right. Like, and I'm going to bring on the thoughts and bring on the feelings that like the bring it on attitude. It's like, it's a step, even a step beyond acceptance in some ways, but it supports us in really practicing with that. Absolutely. Um, so this person's talking about depression. Mm -hmm. So they said, uh, would it be possible to explore the role of depression as an OCD related emotion? I know it's often anxiety, but sometimes it's low mood. And I'm curious how to make space for that experience. Mm. I'd be so curious if this person gets anxious about low mood too, because that yeah. then comes up. Yeah. What does that mean? Right. Does that I, now mean that I'm going to be that way forever? Right. But to make sure, um, remember, this is not therapy, nor is it a replacement for therapy. It's education purposes only. Just had to say it. Um, but I felt like I needed to say it, but that's not it. Anyways, the point, Walter, is um, I was going to touch on this a little bit is that, you know, depression, if this person actually does feel sadness or depression, that we also don't want to um, kind of get in like deeper with depression because some people are like, oh, I feel sad. And at what point do I say, okay, this is uh, not helping me anymore, mm. right? Which goes to what you were talking about is we don't want to, um, I guess, swim deeper into the, the pool, the deep end is that we want to say, okay, sadness is here, but how am I going to bring sadness with me in my life and make space for it? And you treat all emotions like this. Mm. Yeah. And th that doesn't mean that having the emotion be the central focus or accepting that it is there is not making it central. And it's also independent of thinking about the emotion. So instead yes. of like <laughs> ruminating essentially, right. But mm -hmm. so it's so hard. People get confused. And I know I did for a long time too, is like, there's a difference between having the thought, the cognitive, the words, the, you know, that, and then having the feeling, the emotional experience, like you can have the emotional experience without the personal, the, experience. the private experience, the private, 
Yeah. But you can have that without having any thought, right? The emotional experience is totally independent of the thought. But so often when we talk about like, okay, I'm going to accept sadness, people think, oh, I have to sit around and think about the sad thing then and really like churn about it and turn on some sad music and get all up Ooh, in it. Oh, yeah. Oh, feels good though. And oh, same for with, sure. <laughs> and same with joy, right? And like happiness is you can't hold so tightly to these emotions. And I think it's very tempting to, especially if this individual is talking about this fear of like, well, what does sadness mean and depression mean? Does that mean I'm going to kill myself? Or does that mean these thoughts are never going to go away? Or yeah. Right. Um, but it's saying, you know, on the other hand, it's kind of indicative that then this person's holding closely to joy and happiness. It's like yeah. we have to make space that it's transitory. It's never going to stay like this. Yeah. We're not going to realize our dream of constant okayness, as the wonderful Pema Chodron likes to say. Um, yeah, and I think that regardless of what's going on emotionally, to your point earlier, is that if we look at it from the vantage point of recovery, it's all about taking actions that support your goals, your values your priorities, and then accepting whatever comes up. So if that's frustration, that's sadness, that's anxiety, that's anger, that's guilt, that all of that is allowed to be there in the service of you doing the things that matter to you. Right. And remember, you move in and out of acceptance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a permanent be, state. <laughs> yeah, it's not like, oh, got it. Yes. I accept things now. No, yeah. I wish it were like that. That would be great. I do as well. It's like, Oh, now I get it. Yeah. Now it just applies across the board. No, nope. it's a practice because you have to bring that attitude of like, okay, I surrender to this. It's okay. It's here. It's here every yeah. single time. And it's okay. If you miss that and you have to come back, you have to pivot. You have to, it's okay. It happens. I would be a really good basketball player if I were, if it was a mental game if if because i'd be pivoting all the time <laughs> whoa huh. I, I, I think <laughs> just yeah just right up right there so we gotta wrap things up yeah we do yeah we do and i'm sorry you guys i asked so many great questions and i we still haven't answered the other ones but thank you all for doing yeah. this and showing up and asking more questions and um, we try to answer them as best we can. So, yeah. Um, and, and thanks for being part of this community. It means a lot to see all of you here and to, to get to have this dialogue. And, um, perhaps when we next talk, we can talk about meditation and OCD because it's a sort of continuation on this topic. We will not be meeting next week, right? We won't be meeting next week because we're going on an adventure, which is we fun. Are. We may do a few, um, fun stories together because we'll be driving that's true that is true in a safe manner <laughs> i was going to do it in an unsafe manner so. oh good that's true that's probably best yeah yeah so yeah week okay. after next we'll we'll look at maybe meditation um oh actually this is part two on this topic somebody just asked if we could do a part two this is part yeah. two so if you want to go see part one um yeah. That, that already exists on YouTube and on my page and on uh, all the podcast apps now. So, Yeah, and our website, purelyocd.com. That is true. All right. Okay, all. Arrivederci. I will see you. I will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. And everyone have a lovely week. Do it. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.